78 Sports TV here. So I'm checking out my boy Boxing Beast and Rhymes page. Doing it from Boxing Beast and Rhymes channel. This is Tony Thompson. Chilling with Boxing Beast and Rhymes. Hey, Glenn, you chilling with Boxing Beast and Rhymes. This is that Mayor Hardcore Man Store on Boxing Beast and Rhymes YouTube channel. I don't know if you want to. Possible Manny Pacquiao fight with Boy Mayor. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, basically, I mean, it's a fight that still has a potential to happen. Hey, how are you doing, Mr. Bashir? How you doing? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Here with Boxing Beats and Rhymes. Hello, Mr. Oh. Bashir. How we doing? How we doing? Yeah, I'm yeah. good. Yeah, we're good. All right, so we're ready to go. Um, we're with yeah. Boxing Beats and Rhymes, Mr. Ali Bashir. Um, Alex is a youth six trainer. So, so um, yeah, we were talking on Facebook about how we graded him, and I graded him A+. Plus and I broke it down. The reason why I said that is the first time he went into the ninth round, and he stopped the guy who didn't want to be stopped. So for me, like on boxing beats, maybe a bit harsher than you yourself, but for me, I thought it was quite impressive. What was your what, what was your grade? Uh, I I, 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 considered him, I, I I thought that um I thought that he could have done um, some things a little early. I think that he could have did it in seven or six or seven rounds. But uh, I, I didn't condemn him. I gave him an A. He did a good job in, uh, he did in workmanlike fashion. He was patient. He picked his punch as well. And um, he moved and when he had to move and he boxed when he had to box. Um, I'm not interested in breaking records or anything like that. I, I, you know, other guys knocked him out long before that, you know, but he's still uh, a crafty veteran. And you can't judge one fight or what happened in another fight. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the guy says, all right, this is my last shot. I'm going to give it all that I got. So you never know what the mind, the makeup, the mental makeup of the fighter is coming into the fight. So I just uh, had the guy take his time and move to him slowly, break him down a little bit. Hi, I'm Maddie. Act I'm a comedy actress and scriptwriter. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Go on, go ahead, Mr. Bishop. Uh, I had him, you know, just uh, methodically break the guy down mentally and physically, frustrate him a bit. You know, you see he couldn't catch up to him because he kept circling away from him. So I had him break him down and then go in for the, the finishing uh, touch. Yeah, yeah. What was, your, what was um, Vitaly Klitschko saying to you? And um, he, he kept on talking to you. When, uh, uh, eventually he wants people to fight like him. I'm the trainer, you know. Eventually he might have been a championship fighter, but I've been around boxing for 44 years, long before eventually he became a, a boxer or a man. So, you know, uh, I, he basically was telling me what I should have the fighter do, and I was telling him what I was going to have the fighter to do. I'm the trainer, and that's what I stick to training. I don't let people from the audience tell me what to do. I don't care who it is, whether it's the the champion of the world, the former champion of the world, or what? That's my job. My job is training. I'm teaching boxing. I'm not teaching slugging. I'm not teaching standing there and, and, and banging out with somebody, you know, just for the crowd's sake. I'm trying to get a guy through a fight without injury, without being uh, cut or, or broken balls or anything like that. Yeah, the name of the sport is boxing. So I, I disagree with uh, the former champion in that venue that uh, I should do this and that. I'm a trainer. He's not a trainer. He's never been a trainer. So he doesn't know uh, what eyes I'm looking at the fight from. And I, don't, I could care less about what somebody in the audience looked at, you know? Mm -hmm. It was excellent. To me, that's what I'm saying. I was impressed. For me, it was an excellent boxing display. And yeah, I could see some anxiousness in the crowd. But I don't understand that because the thing is, when he, when he, when he could have stopped it up and did that a long time ago. But you like you said, the art of the game is hit not to be hit. That's the sweet science of the game. And he, he was exhibiting, to me, the sweet science of the game of hitting and not being hit. And the opponent was frustrated. And when the opponent started opening them up in the late rounds, then he took him out of there. And, and I thought it was, that's why I thought it was a very good performance against a, a better guy than the last guy. It wasn't, it wasn't the fighters. No. Uh, it wasn't his fault that he didn't finish the fight earlier. He did exactly what I instructed him to do. Okay. And that was the move. To, to move and box and not give this guy any opportunity to punch. Yeah. 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 You understand? The name of the game is not to give this guy any opportunity to punch. Like I said, you can never tell what the mindset of a guy that's 35 years old, that's been stopped well, at least on two occasions by Machuno and uh, the other African kid. Mm -hmm. You know, you never can tell the 
mental makeup of a fighter that comes in in that fight like that beer saying, tonight I'm not going to be stopped. Yeah. So you know, he can't have an opportunity if you don't present an opportunity. That's my thinking. You know, I'm the ever cautious trainer. I don't want my guy to go out there and uh, engage in a war, you know, just for the sake of the crowd. Because when the when his career is over, that crowd won't be nowhere around. That crowd won't be nowhere around, you know, to look after him or care for him. I want to get the guy through the first. This is, that was his sixth professional fight. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that Machuno and uh, the the I forget the African guy's name that that stopped him. But I'm sure those guys had more experience and more fights than Usyk had. I, I, can, I don't care about, uh, like I said before, amateur records. I, the amateurs and the pros are two different entities to me. And you have to pr- approach both of them cautiously, you know? But one more cautious caution than another. Well, I, I can't critique because I'm not a coach and... I'm certainly not a fighter in the league of of um, Vitali, but you know what? The only thing I saw, like the sixth fight, was a good. It was a good victory. His um, his defense isn't as good when he's stationary as it is when he's moving. When he's moving on his legs, obviously he's hard to hit. But when um, he was flat footed, he seemed a li- not vulnerable. He wasn't hurt or tagged with nothing major. But that's the only thing I saw. That's from an armchair supporters. Like, like I said, um, styles make fights, you know. Uh, a fight can look good, one fight can look terrible in another fight. So on any given night, any fight, it can look better or worse, you know. But I, I think that he did a good job overall. And uh, like you said, you know, maybe his defense wasn't that tight in that fight, you know. Um, he got through it. He didn't get injured. So on to the next house and see how he does the next time. You know, the old the old trainers used to say, look good, to, uh, 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 win tonight, look good the next time. Yeah, definitely. It was Lingard M- 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 Kubu. That's the last guy who used to um, stop Daniel um, Daniel Vita. Um, well, I, 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 was, I was satisfied with uh, Usyk's victory. I was satisfied with his work ethic, you know. Uh, what I told Vitaly was that I've only been working with this kid for five five fights. I've worked with him as his trainer. Mm. It, it's going to take more than five fights to make the difference. I don't want to listen to somebody that's outside of the training effort that comes to me from the audience telling me, well, this is what the guy should do. No, that's what you would have done as a fighter. But you can't never say what another fighter should do. I mean, you know, it, it can be said that uh, uh, Vitaly Klitschko went 10 rounds with uh, uh, Thomas Adamak. He went 12 rounds with uh, Derek Chisora. He went 12 rounds with Shannon But I'm sure that people on the outside may say, well, he should have finished those fights before then. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah the fight, he could have finished that earlier as well. That, that, you know, everyone can have criticisms. What, right. what exactly was he saying, though? What was he trying to advise you to do? Until... He, said that the, he said he was saying that Usek was uh, he was moving too much and that he should settle down. But I I got to be the judge of when he should settle down and punch. And when I told him to settle down and punch, you see what happened? Yeah, yeah. But I, I've got to be the judge of that because if something goes wrong out there, the blame is going to always go back to who was the trainer. Yeah. It never fails. Yeah. It never fails. So I can't listen to who shot John in the audience tell me that he should do this, he should do that. I know the guy best. I'm with him every day throughout the training tenure, and I know the guy best when and when not to go. We was in there with a live wide. This guy was trying to find a place to land some punches, and I didn't want to give him that opportunity. I didn't want no cuts, no head busts. I didn't want nothing to happen. And as it turned out, nothing did happen. Yeah, it was a complete, it was a complete shot on the cards. You know, I, did, I couldn't arguably be given one round. <laughs> I, I, I don't give him one round. Can I just no. um, can I just say this? I, and I don't want it to um, if the interview gets um, further than us, which it will do. I don't want it to interrupt with Vlad, who's who's your man and who you, you who you are in the camp. But what Vitali d- done was bang out of order to tell you anything about how to instruct your fire. It was damn out of order, in my opinion. 
Well, you know, some people, you know, you're a fighter, you've been a champion, you know, so you think that you're an authority, but you're only an authority on being a boxer, not from from a trainer's perspective. He can't tell me Jack. He's never been a trainer. No, he hasn't. Nobody has a right to step out of the audience to tell a trainer what to do in the corner. He can only say what he would do in, from his own perspective. But no, I, I think it's out of order to do that. I think that is disrespect. It's disrespect. It's not. It's not good, you know. And I, I shared my displeasure with the champion. You know, I told him, I said, listen, I've got to make that decision when the guy should settle down and fight. I've got to make that decision. I'm the trainer. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to make that decision. Um, some people may be displeased about how I'm, how I'm training him, but I'm training boxers. That's my first priority is to train boxers. Punching, uh, being strong, and all of that stuff comes secondary to me. But the first order of business with me is to train a boxer. The, the, the fundamentals of boxing, you know, boxing etiquette, ring generalship. These are the things that I want to teach first, and everything else comes behind that. Yeah. You see, what is really, and I'm going to say it, you know, I'm shocked. What is really dangerous with him saying that is um, maybe not Alexander Yusek. He may not be swayed by it, but a more impressionable fighter who lives in the same country as Ukraine, they might be saying, well, Maybe I should listen to Vitaly instead of my coach. You know, he, he shouldn't, like, I'm shocked. I'm really shocked. And I mean, I don't care who hears it, you know. I'm not shocked at all. I'm not shocked at all. You have boxers all the time saying what other boxers should do simply because that's the way they would do it. But we know from experience, we know from the past, that that's not the way to do it. I've seen a dozen boxers that acted in a role as a trainer and failed. Yeah. Yeah. But didn't you I feel he was trying to undermine think, your authority? Didn't you feel that? I felt he was trying to undermine your authority doing that. You know, I, I don't know what he was trying to do. I think that he's just over enthusiastic, over zealous, and he's the promoter. So I think that, you know, huh? he, he's the he, he, used do, he used to do that with Emmanuel. He'd do that with Emmanuel's do it too. Oh, he's, that's, that's, he, that's just Vitaly. He's just, that's just what he's going to boast the voice's opinion. And he wants to impose his will on you. And, and if you're weak, you go for that stuff. But no, I'm, I'm the trainer. And I'm going to do it the way I think that it should be done. Okay. You know? Sounds like a bit of a bully. Oh, okay. He's a promoter. He's the promoter, Mr. Bishop. He promoted the show? You know, like I said, you know, the guy's been a boxer all this time. You know, the, oh, hooray. I just spoke to Latimer. Yeah. Latimer Crisco and I spoke uh, three days ago. And Latimer said something that was very profound to me. He said, you know, sometimes boxers don't make the best trainers, or sometimes trainers don't mess to make the best boxers, speaking in reference to Jonathan Banks. He was speaking in reference to his trainer, Jonathan Banks. He said to me, Latimer Clisco says, sometimes boxers don't make the best trainers, and sometimes the trainers don't make the best boxers. They have to find their place, and stay in their place. This is what Latimer Klitschko said to me. So I'm, there's a lot of times that he wasn't wasn't in agreement. Uh, Vitaly wasn't in agreement the way that Latimer was fighting fights. Yeah. But you see yeah, where he's yeah. at. You see where he's at today. He hasn't been defeated in how long? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I, I remember actually reading where Vlad. It seemed Vlad was having a power struggle to find his identity from Vitaly, where Vitaly was telling him he should do this. I think it was around the time he was going for his patch when um, Brewster and Sanders stopped him. And, of, um, course, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, and Vitaly wasn't big on, on uh, Emmanuel Stewart's two list to Latimer Klitschko. Vitaly wasn't big on it, you know? Right. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he has a strong uh, personality, you know, and he... He voices his opinion, but just like he voices his opinion, our voice is mine. He may, you know, he obviously has um, the experience in being a, a top level fighter and a champion for many years, but I've got the experience when it comes to training, and I know when to hold him and I know when to fold him, and I don't need nobody to tell me. I've been at this for 44 years, long before Vitaly Klitschko was even a man. So I don't need somebody to tell me when I need to train, what I need to do in a fight. Yeah. I don't need anybody to do that. So I just maintained my course. I, he said what he had to say. I said what I had to say, and I kept on doing what I did. You see what happened in the end. Yeah. The end results 
My mother said the end results. My mother said the end results is in the tasting of the pudding. You understand? Okay. It doesn't matter the mechanics that you use in making that pie or the pudding. The end result is what the people want. Yeah. All right? Absolutely. Yeah, look, man, I think we should try and change the tone of um of this interview because we're talking like it's a funeral. He won well. He wasn't hurt. Yeah. He wasn't cut. What's, uh, where, where are we going next? Where, what, what we, where are we going next? Well, we're going to wait and see what the K2 Promotions uh, has in store for uh, Alexander Usek, and then we'll go from there. But I'm sure that we'll, we'll, we'll get a live wire. You know, he's a champion, and I'm sure that we'll get a live wire. We'll get another test. Okay. Every fight to me is, is uh, another step towards the championship of the world. And each fight is a different fight. Each fight, each fight is uh, tailor made. You have to tailor made the, the boxer for the fight, fight that he's going to face. You know. Mm. With this fight, yeah, do you know where he's ranked in this in the in the world body right now with this fight? Because that was a pretty decent. Fight. I think he's ranked number five, if I'm not mistaken. He's number five in the world on WBO. I'm pretty sure. Wow, wow, that's are oh, you really fast tracking him for real? Oh, he's number five in the world already. Yeah, I, I think he's number five. I think he's number five in the world. So, um, Marco Hook, boy, look out. <laughs> yeah, Marco Hook is a, Marco Huck is, a, is a champion. He's a champion at heart. He's a champion in his efforts. And as you can see, he's got, what, 13 title defenses since he lost to Stevie Cunningham? Yeah, he's just tied Johnny Nelson's record at the cruiserweight limit. So he's looking next fight. He's looking to um, surpass Johnny Nelson, which is Johnny's not happy about that in the UK, you know. But um, yeah, so that'll be doubt. Uh, sometime next year, you may be looking. Uh, you said maybe ne- well, maybe not next year. The year after, um, a title shot against um, Marco Hook. Marco Hook. Yeah, no, Marco I think Huck. we're gonna fight Marco Hook next year. You think? Yeah, Huck? but you know what the super fight would be for me? I think in maybe a year and a half or so would be against Berbetia. That, you know what I mean? That would be in a year and a half, maybe, when they've both matured and, you know, it, it's a promotable fight. I think the, the Berbetia fight, I, I saw the I, fight I, as a... I, sorry. I'm pretty sure that we're going to probably go against Marco Huck yeah. uh, next year. I just got the gut feeling that. And, and it's a tough fight. It's a tough fight, but Usek is a tough fighter, and Marco Huck is a tough fighter. So it's a, it'll be a great fight for boxing. It'll be a great fight for the cruiserweight division. Yeah, with the style he's adopting, I might give Marco Hook all the problems in the world, man. <laughs> all the problems in the world, you know. And you're right; he's absolutely right. You know, hit and not be hit, and and you, your career, you have your career to go on as long as long as possible. You know, like you said, the less time they get hit, the more that they you know they can. They, the longer time they're going to be in the game. And the way he's fighting. Why do you think? Why do you think Vladimir Klitschko has been around this long, and now he's coming to fruition because? He's boxed, he's grabbed, he's held. He survived the tough times. Now he's starting to come back into his old self with the last fight, the last showing. Get you know, sometimes it takes a fighter uh, time to become comfortable in the ring, comfortable to become uh, uh, profound with being a professional. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you leave the amateurs, you don't have that headgear on and you got the smaller gloves on. You know, you can sit in the audience and say what a guy could do and what he should do, but hey, nobody wants to get clipped with those 10 ounces on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think he can beat Marco Hook with something to spare by next year. I think he can beat him. Um, Mr. Yusek, he can beat Marco Hook with a little to spare. From what I see how he boxes, you know. On the move, um, Hook won't be able to touch him. He won't be able to touch him. The jab will be too quick. I think we're a little, just a li- little bit more seasoning. No rush. No rush. No rush, no rush at all, and I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is let him to come into maturity without forcing me. Yeah. You know, like you put a plant under a lamp and, and force the seed to grow quick. I want him to come into maturity naturally, you know. Yes. So uh, the two last two guys that we fought, both of the guys were from South Africa. They were good um B minus level fighters, you know. They might be on the back sides of their career, but if you go in there uh, uh, fooling around, they're quick and get you out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like the the guy he was fighting, he had a good technique. And what it is, man, I think Yusek realizes that he is a level above these guys, but he's, you've still got to stay concentrated. That makes it pretty difficult. I think the higher the level of competition raises, the the more we'll see 
of what yeah, he's, he's all about. That's think, what I believe. That's what I, I believe. I think that he's going to fight better with the level of competition that he encounters. Yeah. I think that he's going to uh, fight better as he goes, you know. I'm enthusiastic about working with him. Um, we have a good chemistry. He listens well, and uh, he tries to execute on everything that I ask. I just told him, you know, in the corner to be patient behind the jab. When he has room to land the left hand, land it. You know, land the left hand when you have room to. But I saw that the Daniel Venter was trying to counter punch. Mm. So yeah. I, I I constantly had who uh, said to do different things to bait him to see just what he was thinking, and he showed that he was he's waiting to counter punch. He's waiting to counter punch with right hands and. Uh, there was those those people saying, oh, he can't hurt him with the right hand, and so-and-so knocked him out in four rounds, so-and-so knocked him out in seven rounds. But again, that's not being professional to me because you can never uh, go into a fight thinking one thing as opposed to another. That's right. That's how, you, that's how you get knocked out. You know, That's how you'd be looking up at the lights. And then the people that said that to you, they, they shrink to the back of the crowd, and you left out in the open as the one that uh, implemented the idea. I don't like it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And nothing I, 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 well, I pointed out, his conditioning was serious. He continued to be on the on the balls of his foot for nine rounds. And I was thinking, boy, if there was 15 rounds, he probably could have done that as well. His conditioning is tremendous. For someone that big to be able to be bouncing around on his feet, man, I don't know what conditioning you do is it's tremendous, man. Tremendous conditioning. Yeah, it only, only fortifies his strength, mental and physical strength, for the battles that are yet to come, you know? And uh, when he does that, they, again, it only fortifies him and lets him know what he's capable of doing. I think he could do 15 rounds like that easily. Yeah. So, I, in I, fact, I, in fact there, are yeah. many times, there are many times that I have him to uh, go through that inside the gym to see if he can do it. You know, I'll have him do 15 rounds in the gym. Hmm, yeah, you know? Yeah. See, but, you know... Three, four, three, four times in the training camp, I have him do 15 rounds. Mm-hmm. I could tell. I could tell. Is, is, tell. is um, that bouncing... Like, um, I'm not saying to abandon that. I think um, it's great to have them feet, but is that sustainable over a long career? Because look at Sergio Martinez. Like, without that bouncing movement, he, he's, he's not the same fighter. Ali, when he came off his toes, he wasn't really the same fighter. Is it is it advisable? This is from an armchair supporter's um, perspective. Is it advisable to know how to fight flat-footed too? No, Usyk can fight flat-footed, okay. but I'll save that for the time when when he has to do it. But right now, at 27 years old, he doesn't have to do it. Mm-hmm. He's got some years before he settles down. He's 27 years old. At 27 years old, I mean, he's got at least five years of that. Mm-hmm. He could do that for five more years. Yeah. You know, I mean, did you see Vladimir Klitschko in the last fight? Yeah. 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 He was the same thing. <laughs> did you see the foot movement? Did you see the foot movement? Yeah, yeah, he was doing the same thing before yeah. he leaped. He's 37 years old. So I think it's mind over matter. I think that if a guy trains religiously, if he's spontaneous in training, he'll he'll be able to do it in the fight. Yeah, I think of a fight if a guy trains properly, right sleep, right eat, you know, right timing, everything. I think he can do that there five, six more years easily. Okay. You know, it's just a mentality, you know. Yeah. You, you don't have to go out there and. Um, just stand in front of every, stand in front of everybody, you know. But you have to be mobile, you know. That's part of boxing. Uh, Roy Jones was a uh, very mo- mobile, and um, Muhammad Ali, Larry Holmes, very mobile guys. For a long time, they was able to utilize that mobility to carry them over to a win. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. You know, and and. and Holmes did it for a long time. He did it all for a long time until he couldn't do it no more. Yeah. Ali did it a long time. Roy Jones did it a long time. In fact, that was Roy Jones' greatest asset was his mobility, his movement, you know? Yeah. Mr. Bashir, I need to ask you something. I was watching a Larry Holmes fight. It's a rare fight. Do you remember a heavyweight named Roy Williams? Yeah. 
He was pretty Red good. Fox, Red, Red Fox, the comedian, was the manager for Roy Williams. He was cut. He, I was watching him fight Larry Holmes. He's pretty good, man. He was pretty good. He fought, he fought Roy Williams in Landover, Maryland, the same night that uh, Muhammad Ali fought Jimmy Young. Yeah. I was there at that fight. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And Roy Williams, I think, was undefeated with Larry Beaton. I'm not sure if he's undefeated. He was never stopped. He, he could have been undefeated, actually. He actually could have been, yeah. Think, you, yeah, yeah. Larry, I think when Larry Holmes fought Roy Williams, I'm not certain, but uh, it was in Landover, Maryland. I remember it was Landover, Maryland, because he fought Jimmy Young that night, Muhammad Ali did. And um, most people thought that Roy Williams was going to give it to Larry Holmes, and Larry Holmes flipped the switch on him, you know? Yeah. Like, Roy, he was a good fight because he, like, he'd pick your shots off in the glove, and he was big. He had a big, long reach, and he was tall. And it jab, jab your head off. He, he was a good fighter, man. He was good. He was good. He was good. He was good. I was impressed with that, you know? And um, did you hear about Ernie Terrell? He passed away. Yeah, I just heard about Ernie Terrell. I salute him, and I respect him, you know? He was a good fighter. Indeed. Indeed. Very good fighter, you know? And speaking of good fighters, uh, another thing I was impressed with about Usyk was the way he finished the fight. Yeah, that's right. If you look at the tape again of the fight, you'll see in the corner just before the stoppage in the ninth round, before the beginning, I told Usyk, you can see me tell him in the corner to go out and finish this fight now. Mm -hmm. This guy is, is shot, he's tired, he's exhausted. Go out there and help him get out of this fight. Mm -hmm. I told him in the corner, go out and, and finish this fight now. And he went out and did just that. And the way that he did it, I was impressed because he punched and he didn't stop punching until he was on the floor. <laughs> yeah. the, referee to, the referee had to basically come between him and stop him from punching. That's how you stop him. That's how you stop a guy in the ring. That's how you stop him. Yeah. yeah. He showed a lot of killer instinct when he finished off his man, though. I have to say yeah. that. He was, it was quite vicious. Hey, it's the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the beast. It's, it's, it's the nature of the sport. It ain't always pretty, but um, it's effective. And uh, I like the way he finished the fight. Yeah, wear him down and take him up. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, what, what people have to bear in mind, and that's what I was watching all the time, like, um, Venter was looking for the counter and he was still strong like you know you, you can't just you gotta peck him you gotta peck him and wear him down a little more you need to wear him down and he, he was just he waiting was looking, for, yeah. he was looking for the counter punches he was looking for counter punches and I saw that from the very first round so I said just take your time work behind your jab and land your left hand when you do but in the meantime win the rounds and that's just what he did yeah 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 he's working he's working, he's working the right hand up and down the body Usek told me as early as the fifth round, I can go and I can do this now, you know. But I said, no, no, let's just be patient. That's the kind of trainer I am. I'm not trying to build wrong base. I can finish this now. I can get him now, you know. I can get him now. But I held him back. I held him back because I didn't think that the time was right. And as you can see in the seventh and eighth round, you can see Venter throwing counter punches. He was trying to get lucky. Oh, yeah. You know. He was trying to get lucky. And I don't want this young charge to run into nothing. You know, I don't need a guy out on the on the back burner for six months healing up from a cut or a broken hand or something from getting into a slug fest. I didn't need that. Yeah. We can box the guy with all the rounds and, and get the lesson and, and go home. I mean, everybody cares about a knockout, but not to the extent where I want my guy to get hurt getting it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Knockouts come when you're just doing your job. You're not supposed to go out and try and force them. That's what I was always always told by the old timers. Don't try and force the knockout. You know? Work for your no, openings. And when you open it's come take them. And that's what he did. That's what he did. Yeah. It, it, it was it's, it's, it's wise advice. It's wise advice, you know. You take your time, you know, to take your time. And walk him down slowly and try to get the KO like that. Otherwise, go the distance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I don't, I don't want my guy going out trying to knock everybody out. Sometimes you, you go out of your, your, your um, way trying to get these knockouts, you know, trying to keep up with the knockout thing, and you get in trouble like that sometimes. And I'm not that, I'm not a fan of that, you know? 
I'm a fan of pure boxing. You know, boxing and every everything else falls into place behind that. You know, I, I hear people. Everything is like a cliche in boxing. These people say, oh, oh, you know, that you know, everything comes off the jab. But in my mind, no, everything doesn't come off the jab. Everything does not come off the jab. In my mind. Everything comes off the faint. Even the jab. Everything starts off of that faint. Yeah. Or as the old timers would say, stutter step. You understand? Stutter step. You never know. You know, if you look at Jersey Joe Walker, you look at uh, Jimmy Young and other fighters of the past who use those those little deeks and faints, you can learn the art of boxing from that. Because faint, fainting is a is a separate art from boxing. They're two different entities, and yeah. so is the application. So I, 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 I don't think that anybody should just grab a hold to cliches and say, you know, that this is the best way. Everything comes off the jab. Yeah. You hear something from it, everybody jumps on that band like, yeah, everything comes off the jab because it's, it sounds clichéist, and it actually is because everything in my mind, as my trainer taught me in 1959, he said, no, everything comes off the faint. Yeah. And that's, I hold on. To, yeah. Yeah, because it opens, that makes you make a mistake, and then you can do what you want to do. You yeah, I know my, the average human being, I don't care nobody, the average human being is going to flinch if somebody faint them. Yeah. I know I am. If you faint me a couple of times, I'm going to get away from you. I'm just a step away. You have to, you have to be fainting all night because I won't be there. You faint me, I'm not to be across the street somewhere. Yeah. Mm. Lennox Lewis, though, I was watching him this week on um, a ringside program, and they was talking about just technique. And he said he doesn't faint when he throws the jab because he says you're showing pers- your opponent that you're going to jab. So he like had his style what, like he was showing Deontay Wilder not to telegraph it, and he'd just shoot it out, and he wouldn't faint. So like you say, there's, right. no, there's no right way. There's no right way. It works. F- I mean, like, no wrong way. I, I disagree with Lennox on that. I disagree with him, you know. Uh, you know, it's because you don't show a guy a faint. You can faint a guy once, or you can faint him fifteen times. How, how do you know when the guy gonna throw, throw a jab? You know, if you're gonna faint and then throw the jab, yeah, they're gonna be looking for. It. But if you faint the guy fifteen, twenty times, how do you know when the jab gonna come? <laughs> Is that you don't know what's gonna come? Yeah. <laughs> You well, at, Joe Walker, at, Joe the same, Walker, at the same time, he was successful. So, like, it's like you said, there's, there, like, it works like indiscriminately. Like, it works for over here, and it don't work there. Some people use, some people yeah, use that. I mean, well, he was successful. He was successful, but you can't say that that doesn't work for other guys. I mean, he wasn't boxing super fast guys. He wasn't boxing really fast, super fast guy. So, I mean, he could land that jab. He was a good boxer, you know. But uh, he wasn't boxing super slick, super fast guys either, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. I, 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 I had a young guy that I had a young guy that used to box Lennox all the time, Maurice Harris out of New Jersey. Yeah. And this guy could box. He could really box. I mean, he was a fantastic body. He used to give Lennox fits because he was real slick and quick and good face and stuff, you know, and it would throw Lennox off, you know. Yeah. It would throw him off out of sync a lot of times. That what the, that's what the art of feigning is. That's what the, the art of deking and feigning and stutter stepping. And all, that's all all combined in the faint move. The faint, like I said, is, is, a, is a boxing attitude, yeah. you know. And I, that's, that's one of the things I teach boxers, you know? Yeah. That's why I used to see, uh, watching the old black and whites of Sam Langford. I see him throwing fates on his opponents, and he was excellent at it, man. Look at Archie Moore. Look yeah. at Archie Moore. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So you got, you can't say that this it's not effective. It's been effective. I would suggest that people fate each other to try to keep off what might be coming. Because, like I said, when you feign a guy, he's got to start all over again. That that feint can break up anything that you're trying to do. You, you better pay attention and respect to him because if you don't, you can find yourself in a world of trouble. Yeah. 
I, I agree. And also as well, because the Usyk is a southpaw, it makes it doubly hard because he, he's got the foot movement and, and he, he makes sure the guy's always in his target range and he works his right hand up and down. Um, he's very hard to deal with. Very, very awkward. You know, any guy going to fight him is very hard. Slick, I, I was quite actually calling him a slick southpaw. Because <laughs> he's just, you know, the way he was moving and stuff like that, it's very hard to hit. Yeah, I was depending on that, and I'm still depending on that. Like I said, I always implore Usyk. One thing that he didn't do, he didn't use a lot of jabs in that fight. Now I was imploring him that to use the jab because a southpaw jab is is very very difficult to deal with. Hmm. It's very difficult to deal with a southpaw jab, and when you're not jabbing, then you leave, then you invite yourself to be jabbed against, you know. So we, you know, it's something that we have to work on. You know, there's, there's some things that he's doing, and and that he's not doing that we have to work on. It's a work in progress. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so what sparring partners do you come in, bring in, bring in? Um, when you when you when you're analyzing your opponent, um, what sort of part of sparring partners are you using for for Usyk getting ready for these fights? Well, mostly, uh, you know, uh, young Ukrainian guys. These are rugged, tough guys, and they come in and give us the work that we need. I look at the styles of them, and I bring them from all over Ukraine. Wow. We haven't, we haven't brought in the world-class guys outside of Olaf. Olaf, he came in and gave us some work. Okay. How'd that go? Olaf was with us for a couple of weeks until his fight fell out, and then he left. He, f- okay. he fell out? Oh, Alpha Lobby was there. He was working with us. He worked with us for two weeks, and then this fight where Hernandez fell out, and then he left. But we got some good work from Ola Alpha Lobby. Oh yeah, I bet, I bet. He was on the program too. He was talking about his overhand right and how he throws his overhand right. He's in, uh, Mr. Alpha Lobby. He was on there too on this. Uh, talking about what? Same program as Len- that Lennox was on. He's he talking-, talking about what? No, he was on the program that Lennox Lewis was. They were just uh, discussing technique and showing how to do certain techniques. And Ofalabi was on there. He was showing how he threw his overhand right. He's talking about ringside. He's talking about, he's talking about ringside. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. That's what talking about. He's talking about the UK show over here called Ringside. Yeah. Okay, earlier on, came out earlier on today. Right. Yeah, and um, they, were, they were showing techniques of, of the fight. So Ofalabi's fight has been cancelled with uh, Hernandez. Hernandez, that fight's been postponed? Yes, the fight has been postponed. Do you know why? Uh, Hernandez injured himself. It's a shame. I was looking forward to that. It's a shame. So next year, there's probably something for next year. It's a shame. Okay. Um, yeah, the, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Bashir. He had a slight injury, so they had to postpone the fight. I think they moved it up a couple of months, but the fight's still going to happen. Okay. Yeah, um, I sent you two videos from IFL TV, and um, you said... <laughs> I asked you how it was when you when you when you get off the off you get off the floor laughing your head off. So did you actually watch the videos I sent you? Yeah, I did. What, what was your take on it? What was your take on what Tyson Fury had to say? No more than it has been for all the other guys that came to fight Vladimir Klitschko. Everybody says what they have to say uh, coming toward the fight with Vladimir Klitschko, but but nothing special. Nothing stood out. To me, nothing stood out at all. Okay. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing that you can hang your hat on and say, wow, I'm really worried about it. I mean, Tyson Fury is a good fighter, mm-hmm. you know, and he's going to come with a plan, and, and we've got to formulate a plan to try to come battle. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, huh? you know, no, no, no that's, that's great. So you would say, see when you talk about the kingpin. I keep thinking about the kingpin. They were saying this. Like, he uses a lot of feints when he fights um. <laughs> He uses a lot of feints only when he fights, so he's going to give uh, Joshua a lot of problems. How do you see that fight going? It depends on which Kevin Johnson shows up. If Kevin Johnson is at his best, he can cause a lot of problems for young Joshua. Young Joshua is going to do what young Joshua has been doing. He has no reason to change because he's been successful at it. Yeah. And I think that he's uh, still maturing. There's no doubt in my mind he's still maturing. But a, a seasoned guy that wants to be in that ring, that wants to perform, could cause problems for Anthony Joshua. But it's going to be a difficult fight for both guys, I think. I think it will go the distance? Yeah, most likely. I think it will go the distance. That would be good for him, you know. That would be good for him because no one's gone the distance as well. That would be good for him. 
Kevin Johnson is not just the kind of guy that you can knock out. You just don't come in the ring and knock out Kevin Johnson. Yeah. Like I said, if Anthony, if, if Anthony Joshua could knock out Kevin Johnson, that that'll be a big feather in his resume. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it, his resume would really be ringing. You know, if he can do that. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's good to know, man. Um, yeah, it, uh, to going back, going back to Usyk, Alexander Usyk. Yeah, so the nine rounds, man. He, he, he like he done it very fairly comfortably and stuff like that. So, looking in, uh, obviously you're not uh, choosing the opponent and stuff like that. But in the cruiserweight division, there's not much. There's it's quite thin from where we are and where we are to the champions and that. So he probably get like you said, he probably get a shot, a, a championship shot against Marco Hook sometime next year. You could see, I could actually see that happening. It'd probably be in the Ukraine as well because. Or maybe in Germany, probably. So it, it, that would be very interesting. And a lot of people, you know, because we, you know, did you see our commentary on um on the actual fight? What do you what do you think? Or how do you think our commentary was? On what? We we commentated on on the on the Usyk the Usyk's last fight. What do I think on the commentary of his last fight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think we was accurate about what we were saying? What you guys said? Yeah. Yo, you, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear your commentary. Oh, you haven't seen it. I sent you a version of we. Yeah, we do commentary in it. We, you know, we we we, we found. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, on the on the um, the recent, mail you sent me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The recent fight we done commentary in it. So everything we were saying was everything we said now today. We were saying it when we was commentating. Okay, I'll take a look at it. I, I saw two uh two messages you sent to me, and I thought it was the Tyson Fury messages. No, yeah, no. Okay, I, no, it's one before, and I'll send you again. I'll yeah, send yeah you again. I, I saw the one before that. Now I'll, I'll take a look at it. Okay, all right. I'll take a look at it. I'll take time to take a look at it. But um, we were saying everything was happening in time, but you see that the when we, when when uh Vitaly was talking to you, he wasn't aware about it. Wasn't normally because in the last fight that that didn't happen, and, but this fight obviously went longer. And, you know, it was a lot of time he was in the corner talking to you. He was trying to work I got the impression that they may have gotten nervous, but I, I never got the nerves at all during the fight. Yeah. I felt that we had the fight under control. I felt that at some point in the fight that he would catch him, and, and then when he catch him that he would finish it, and that's what happened. Mm. Even if he had gone the distance, I would have felt that he had a chance to stop him all the way to the last second of the fight. Yeah. Who's second that kind of guy? Once he lands that good shot, then it's, then it's most of the time it's a done deal. Okay. Well, and the fact and the fact that Daniel didn't try to hold. He didn't try to hold. He tried to fight. Yeah. He was trying to fight his way out of trouble as opposed to holding. Yeah. You said it was just too quick, too sharp, too quick, too sharp. Always a step ahead. No, I, I, I really appreciate uh, Daniel Venter. He's a classy guy, and he came there, and he tried. He tried. You know, I mean, you can't ask more, no more from a fighter than what you got, you know? Yeah. Uh, the South African fighter, the ones that I've encountered, uh, I mean, I have great respect for them because they come to fight. Mm-hmm. You know, they come to fight. They, they don't come to play. They come to fight. Mm-hmm. And I have great respect for them and, and always will respect them, you know? Yeah. So Vitaly, you say Vitaly is the is is the promotional now. He does the he's promoting the fight now. Is that right? K two Promotions is the Klitschko Klitschko Brothers Promotions. Oh, I know that. Okay. Oh. K two Promotions is the Klitschko Brother Promotions. It's been around for years. See. So who's that? What? Burn 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 Burn? Uh, what's, I thought he was the. Yeah, Burn Yeah, I thought he was the. Okay. All right. He's the K two East Klitschko Management Group. Yeah, That's the yeah. Chris management group in K2 Promotions is Tom Loeffler. You know, it's two different uh, entities there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're, but, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're powerful. Vitaly and Vlad are powerful people, man, even outside the ring. You know, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they're, they're classy guys and they're, and they're, they're intelligent guys, you know. And, and uh, they 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 own the whole ball of wax. They their own promoter, their own manager, everything. So and it's been like that for years. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, they they manage also uh, Ola Falabi. They manage uh, Triple G. So you know, they they do making some strides. 
you know, they was managing Jonathan Banks. I think that's done. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jonathan Banks, yeah. We haven't even asked you about that. Um, what's your take on that with um, Jonathan, with Jonathan Banks and Anton, Antonio? Well, well? I, I told you when you asked me about it, I said it depends on what Jonathan Banks shows up when you first asked me about it. I had him, uh, I picked him to, to decision Antonio Tarver, and then I said it depends on what Jonathan Banks shows up, and obviously that's not the Jonathan Banks that I know. Yeah. That's not the Jonathan Banks that I know. He's a better puncher, better boxer. It just looked like he never got out, never got his foot off first base. Mm, 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 mm. Do you reckon that's to do with too much distractions, obviously, with um just too much distractions of and they're not focused enough? Uh, you know, I, one thing I don't buy into when a when a guy says that I was distracted because I was training the champion, or I was distracted because I was sleeping around, or I was distracted because uh, I was having marital problems. Don't get your ass in the ring. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's all. But because when you get the ring, when you get in the ring, a lot of people is involved with your with your efforts. Yeah. And it reflects and it reflects on a lot of people that's around you. So if you're having problems with your with your lady and you're having problems with your mortgage or you're having any kind of problems that's gonna take away from your performance in that ring, my suggestion is don't get your ass in the ring. So all that this distraction stuff, I don't wanna hear. I don't want to hear. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um what I wanted to input is like because a fight a, a, a fighter, he needs he he wants to be the center of attention in the gym. People are catering to his needs, the trainers, whoever, even the people holding the water bucket. But he's been giving all his attention to another fighter in cultivating him. How easy could it be for him to actually say, Okay, well, it's all on me. I, I'm I'm in the ring now. The the spotlight's on me. Is it easy to switch from that to that, wouldn't you say? From being a trainer of the heavyweight champion to now, I've never, I've never been a I've never been a professional boxer. You know, I've never juggled the say, two at the same time, so I couldn't possibly answer that kind of question. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, I would think that it would be difficult to wear those hats. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that at the age, I think Jonathan came into the job at 31 years old. I, I would have just said with respectfully you know I, I got my own career i would have never tried to engage that i would have never tried to do that there but some people i don't i don't i just don't understand the thinking of them you're 31 years old you're in the prime of your life and you're trying to be a champion and then you train a trainer train another guy to do it but so i i don't understand i don't understand, i just don't understand the thinking of the young man that did that but he did do it he undertook it he tried to fight and try to be the trainer. Yeah. You know, I just don't think that the two mix. Personally, I don't think the two mix. You know, I would have stayed as a boxer to see what I could do, what kind of noise I can make, uh, what kind of name I can make. Maybe I can get into a position. I'm sure yeah. that uh, K2 would have got him in a position to fight for a title at some point. You know, uh, Deontay or one of those guys. But, you know, he made the decision, and now, and now it looks like he's going to be relegated to being a trainer for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, get it out of your system first, and then, you know, fall back on the training after, yeah. Get the boxing out of your system. That's well, I guess that was a chance of a lifetime. A lot of me off from the job, and he, he jumped for it. But in the meantime, he uh, sacrificed his own career. It seems to, seems to be that way, that he sacrificed his own career to do that. Yeah, yeah. So what's your take on Antonio Tarver winning, obviously winning, so what do you think Tarver's going to do, man? He's calling out. <laughs> what do you think he's going to do in the heavyweight division? How's yeah, it? You know, I, I think that I think that is good for for the division, but I don't think that he's going nowhere. Mm-hmm. I don't see him going nowhere. Yeah, you yeah, know, at, at the age that he's at, the age that he's at, um, his style. I, I just don't see him cracking. Cracking those guys like uh, Joshua, Wilder, Stephen, uh, Ruiz, these kind of guys. I don't, I don't, I don't, I just don't 
think that he's going to be able to do nothing with those guys. Ruiz is like the baby of, of those guys. He's short, stubby, but he comes to fight. Yeah, you know? He's fighting soon as well. I can't remember he's fighting. He comes to fight, you know, and, and as slick as Tarb is, he might have a lot, he'd have his hands full with that kid. You know, so I, I don't think that he's going over there. I mean, I, I don't see Tarver, uh cracking Vladimir Klitschko's anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he would what, what he do. I mean, he'd get, he'd get paid, but he'd take a beating in the process. <laughs> Mr. Bashir, I don't like Andy Ruiz's condition. I don't like it. Huh? I don't like Andy Ruiz's conditioning. I don't like the... He doesn't look in shape. Yeah, but he's a young guy, so a lot of that's baby fat. Mm. He doesn't look in shape, but you have you seen him fight? Yeah, I have. and um, Some of the performances, I haven't been that impressed, you know? No, I haven't either. He's got to get some of that, rid of that fat, but I think that fat will come off him. He got a lot of baby fat on him, but he comes to crack, you know. He comes to crack. He's got to get it off him. Yeah. I feel, I've seen other guys like that there that had that same kind of baby fat on him and, and knock your lights out, you know. But, but he's, how old is Ruiz? 23? How old is Ruiz? He's, um, he's about 25. Yeah. Maybe it'll work it off him in time, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And his reach, he's got a very short reach as well, man. So, I don't know. Maybe he could be. He, he could. He could exceed my pessimism. He, you know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. We'll see next I year. Yeah, about, I'm thinking that also about David Tua too. Yeah, he had a short reach. Yeah, he did. And he got a good knockout, but he's very powerful. <laughs> yeah, very powerful. That's what I'm saying. We have to wait and see what goes on with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're drifting off. Alex Zusik, and this is supposed to be the post fight, so we drift off. So, well, we've got the closing for, for um, Alexander Usyk. What's the. Um, so, next year, we've got a world title for Alexander Usyk. No doubt, Mr. Pichu, yeah? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, they're going to move for the world title next year. 2015, that, you know, uh, they'll uh, move for the world title. Well, that's good. Anything else, Beach, you want to add? No, we've summed it all up. We appreciate yeah. your time, Mr. Bashir. And we look forward to seeing what Mr. Yusuf It's a pleasure. Do. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys, you yes. know. Yeah, if we don't... If pleasure, we... And, um, go, on. go ahead. We're going to try not to let you guys down. We're going to try to uh, get better with each time out. But as I said before to all the people in the listening audience, you know, that... Boxing is like driving. The terrain changes at every mile. Nothing goes smoothly like 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 you think that it's gonna go. There's a curve, and there's some rough spots, you know, so it's it's difficult. Boxing is a difficult sport. You have to make adjustments, you know, you have to make a trust adjustments to be able to win and maintain man, maintain the record of winning. Yes indeed. Absolutely. And on, on that note, we yeah, hope if we don't talk to you by this year, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And, and obviously, uh, Alexander Usyk and a world title beckons next year. So thanks for your time, Mr. Bashir. And uh, yes. obviously, oh. you're going to sign out with a U- Ukraine um, <laughs> to say goodbye in Ukraine as well. Go ahead. I'm here in Ukraine and um, I'm enjoying it. I'm doing work with other fighters here. I'm- you know, so I haven't even gone home. I haven't been home in three months. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, and I probably won't get home until sometime in mid-January or something. Okay. Wow. Because I'm here working with other fighters, so. Uh, That's more or less home as well. You've got two homes. Yeah, yeah. And Austria, too. Don't forget Austria. Austria is home, too. And, and and I've been zipping down the down the um, uh, Germany. So Germany between Germany, Austria, and uh, Ukraine is like like second home for me because I'm in and out of all all those uh, different countries. Um, I'm trying to open a gym down in Dusseldorf. 
trying to open a gym here in the Ukraine. So I'm, I'm pretty busy, thank God, you know, that I have work. And then I have people who uh, want to work with me. Mm. So I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be doing some work. Uh, I'll fly down to Dusseldorf on next Wednesday uh, to sit down and, and go over details, trying to open a gym there in Dusseldorf. And then I'll come back up to Austria to our training camp and then back to the Ukraine. And sometime next year, God willing, I'll go home, you know. But right now, there's boxing business that has to be taken care of, you know. And I want to do as much as I can while I can. Mm. Well, you know? yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks, man. For sure. We'll let's sign out with um, 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 a, a Ukraine. To how do you say goodbye in Ukraine again for the fight fans listening? That's be done, yeah. That's be done. Goodbye. Uh, but for right now, it says Pacone Noche. Good night. Good night. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lichier. Take care, my friend. Yes, sir.